Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rinse land of time, back with the man, myth, the legend, Mr. Jonathan Twanley. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great, Michael. How are you? I'm doing great. I want to talk about a very exciting book that I will be ordering this morning uh, that you've been powering through. I'd love for you to highlight the book and maybe give us some little tidbits. Look at that. So uh, this is The Lords of Easy Money. I'll give a shout out to my friend John Montero, who's the one who recommended that I read this. He tagged me on Facebook. We just ordered it, and I went out and got it right away. It is a very, very readable book about a, compli about a pretty complicated and arcane topic, which is the, the Federal Reserve and stuff like quantitative easing. And the, I haven't quite finished the book. I've got a couple pages left to go. But basically, the argument in the book is that the Fed uh, is really, in large part, uh, responsible for the massive inequality problem that we have right now and the asset bubbles that we have right now, which are basically one and the same thing, because after the Great Recession, it embarked on this unprecedented effort to pump massive amounts of cheap money into the system through un, un, you know, their up until then unused devices like quantitative easing. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't simply enough to lower, to lower interest rates, but even after the recession, the sort of the, another great depression was averted by, by aggressive and, and justified Fed action to avert it, mm -hmm. they went one step further and tried to create a fast recovery by basically creating as sort of like 10 times as much money in a couple of years as they had created from the creation of the Fed in 1913 through 2007, mm -hmm. right? So, um, and it, it spends a lot of time talking about one of the Fed presidents, uh, Honig, I'm not recalling his first name right now, who uh, became one of the few people to dissent from this policy mm -hmm. and on the basis that the Fed was creating, was blowing a huge bubble. I mean, we had just, we had, just had a big recession because of a bubble, mm -hmm. right? Or actually sort of two successive bubbles, the dot-com bubble and then the real estate bubble. Mm -hmm. And then all the Fed did was blow an even more massive bubble, which right. was going to come back to bite it someday. And, uh, and now we're kind of seeing potentially the effects of that. So it's a very, very interesting book. I really recommend that you, uh, that you, that you all read it if you're interested in you know, how this process works. Um, I mean, the only thing that I sort of take issue with the book is I don't think it's simply what the Fed did after the, the financial crisis, but I think that, you know, it, it doesn't really, I don't think it put, puts enough blame on, on Greenspan. It really mm -hmm. kind of puts all the blame on Bernanke and, and then sort of Yellen for continuing Bernanke's policies and stuff. And then Powell for, you know, Powell was also a dissenter for then get, becoming Fed chairman and basically continuing the same policies. But I think, you know, Greenspan walks away a little too mostly. clean. And just sort of overlooked in this whole oh. process, right? Not, okay. not really discussed that much. And I think, frankly, what, what Greenspan did in the, you know, in the 90s and 2000s kind of set the stage for all this. So, yeah, I would actually agree, right? Greenspan's really the first Fed president I started to study. I think he was in, yeah, he was the Fed president when I was getting my econ degree. Um, and yeah, I think he certainly laid the foundation that Bernanke, Yellen, and then Powell kind of inherited so uh does it actually get because i i agree i mean folks go back and watch interview one and two today uh i think we are in an asset bubble and, and when people talk about a wealth gap i think it's better said an asset gap uh you know that's the, you know not to split hairs but i do think it's a, it's the ownership of assets and does it really give any thoughts to hey if we do pop it what might be the ramifications or is it more about hey Look at that massive bubble that we've just blown. I don't know, because I haven't finished it. So maybe okay. yeah, the book talks about what, what's going to happen. Okay. Uh, so we'll see. Um, but, but we've seen a couple of bubbles pop. And, you know, again, when you, when you say pop a bubble, as, as we talked about in episode one, it is fast, it is sudden, it is unexpected, and it is quick. It, uh, and it's painful, and it's hard to get out of, is the problem, right? Because yeah. I'm like, see, the, this is... So what really annoys me, right, is that so the last the last several recessions we've had have been essentially finance related recessions, right? 
Mm -hmm. going back to the dot-com bubble and sure. then, then the, the housing bubble and, and whatever. They've, been, they've certainly been easy money bubbles. I mean, you go back to dot-com, which I lived through, invested in, easy money. Everybody yeah. thought you were Warren Buffett and then real estate, you couldn't go wrong. It always goes to the moon. Yeah, absolutely. Right. They've, been, they've, been, they've been financial, they've been financial recessions. Yeah, they haven't financial been, engineering, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. They haven't been business recessions. And, you know, the last business recession that we had was in the early 90s, regular mm. business cycle recession. And I think, and then you had Greenspan come in after that. And Greenspan's belief was, hey, we can basically eliminate the business cycle or at least like really ameliorate it. Mute it, yeah. With, with monetary policy. And we can sort of fine tune. That's interesting. Economy, right? yeah. And so, and all that happened was then they, they blew bubble after bubble. Right, because they refuse to let the wow. business cycle take its core, you know, take its its normal path. But the business cycle, when you think about it, here's what happens in the business cycle recession. I mean, it's very this is very simplified, but you think about like everybody in the economy buying stuff, right? Yeah. And they're buying dishwashers and they're buying cars and they're buying stuff like that, and that creates jobs. What yeah. happens is you reach a point where everybody has bought all the stuff they need, right? And the, the market is saturated; they don't need any more stuff, so they stop buying it, right? And it, and it hasn't started breaking yet, doesn't need to be replaced yet. Mm -hmm. So demand drop, you know, inventories build up, demand drops, and you, and you have a business cycle recession. And then after a little while, stuff starts breaking, people, you know, prices get lowered, people start seeing bargains, and they start spending money again, and then you get, you start having growth again, right? The Fed decided, well, we don't want to have that nastiness, because it's unpleasant when people lose their jobs. So we, we can fine tune the econ economy by, well, essentially giving people cheap money to keep on buying stuff. Mm -hmm. And, but all that did was mask, mask economic reality, get people to just consume more. It caused Americans to go deeper and deeper into debt, right? And so the problem, it's the debt that's the issue, right? And so then what happened was when people, when you have these debt crises instead of a business cycle crisis, you know, the business cycle crisis is just people like taking a break from buying and then going back to buying and then taking a break from buying, going back to buying. Mm -hmm. What happens with, when people are indebted? Well, they've got to service the debt, right? They have to, they have to pay back the debts. So that means that they can't, they're, instead of buying stuff, they're paying off debt from stuff they bought before, mm -hmm. right? So that, that, and then you look at companies, the companies become incredibly indebted, right? And now they have to pay back all this debt, right? They have to service this debt. They may not be able to service the debt because lenders may not want to give them the money to, to service the debt. So it's very, very difficult to dig your way out of a debt-fueled recession because it's not that the money isn't there, right? It's that the money is being, it's all being, it's all going into servicing debt instead of into stuff that creates jobs, right? So, yeah. and that's where we've gotten where by trying, you know, it's, it's, it's just like, again, un unintended consequences. By trying to eliminate the business cycle, we created yeah. a worse problem. Right by by causing Americans to become ever more indebted, right? Yeah. And so um, it's it's just uh, it's it is so scary to think about. I I was just reliving the last thirty years, and you're right. Greenspan did try to mute the business cycle. And mute, the business cycle is a healthy part. It's frankly a very healthy part of the yeah. the, the the capitalism, right? You've got to clear the underbrush sometimes. You got to, the people that aren't using capital appropriately need to go out of business. Yeah. And um, if we really have 30 years of not clearing the underbrush and we kind of get the business cycle now, that could be a problem. Yeah. I mean, it's just, we just created a bigger problem for ourselves, right? By yeah. trying, to, trying to avoid a small problem. Right, yeah. that was unpleasant. And frankly, too, I think that the Fed was also, you know, as 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 the government allowed companies to move jobs overseas mm -hmm. to China and Mexico and places where it would be cheaper, and Americans were left with not as good jobs to do. They had to somehow fill the consumption gap. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you take good-paying jobs and you send them overseas and you replace them with low-paying jobs. How are you supposed to keep a consumption-driven economy going in that situation? Well, you let people get cheap money so they can yeah. just indebt themselves, you know, and then 
figure out, well, someday later something will happen and then it'll all go away. And it'll all go away. <laughs> I'll it, win the lottery. Yeah, it'll all be fine. But I mean, yeah. as a country too, like, well, yeah, no, I get it. Yeah. massive consumer debt will just somehow solve itself as opposed to becoming a huge drag on the economy. And, you know, you see this happen, this happened in Japan too. I mean, they had a demographic problem on top of it, but they did the same thing. They sent all their jobs to China and they, and they, but they had to, people had to keep their consumption up. So what did they do? They just borrowed and borrowed and borrowed and, in, you know, indebted themselves to the point where like people committing suicide because they couldn't deal with their debts is like a thing that happened. So um, fortunately we're not there yet, but, uh, when you talk about deaths of despair in the United States, uh, it's related to the economy. And anybody who says sure. it's not related to like the good jobs going overseas and people having crushing debts and not being able to live the American dream. I mean, yeah, that's that's where the deaths of despair are coming from, if you ask me. So, so it, this book is dealing with a really complicated or potentially complicated, you know, financial, economic, monetary policy. Is it is it something that the average person will read and kind of understand and get entertained by? You think? Well, yeah, I mean, I would say that the average investor, the average yeah. person who's listening to this podcast, it's a very readable book. I mean, it's awesome. really, like kudos to Christopher Leonard who wrote it. It is very, very awesome. Like it, it reads like a novel. I mean, oh, great. it tells a great story. So uh, w- without, I think, without giving short shrift to the actual economics, I think it does a good job of balancing. Very cool. Well, folks, I'm going to be ordering this book maybe in a month or so. Uh, we'll have a, I don't know, a book club or something. We'll, I'll do a live stream where we talk about, we break down the book. So I'm going to be ordering it today. Jonathan, thank you so much for these interviews. Where can people find you? So, uh, number of places. If you want to join my investor list, please come uh, Google Two Bridges Asset Management LLC, and you can see the investor form and fill it out. Uh, if you want to join my Facebook group where we talk about multifamily, uh, that is free, and you can go just find multifamily investment community on Facebook. And finally, if you would like to join my general mailing list and get my ebook, uh, you can go to multifamilylaunchpad.org and download it there. Very cool. Thank you very much, Jonathan. Thank you.